Supervisor. Brother Ten will lead us in. Oh. A prayer. Hello. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with heavy hearts for the loss of the 19 firefighters yesterday in the Yarnell fire. We pray for comfort for their families and all the residents of that area who have suffered such a great loss. We pray for all the five firefighters in our area, Lord, that are doing their best to protect us and properties around, and we ask that they all be safe. Now this morning we come before you with business and we ask that you give us guidance as we set about to do this business before you and do it according to your will. We ask all of these things in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Please, Supervisor join, me, please join me in the pledge. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I don't have the call to the public. Supervisor Moss, are you online? I am. Did you hear that, Peggy? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you, Supervisor Moss. We can hear you. I'm just waiting for the uh, call to the public. Great. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, yes, I'm fine. Mm -hmm, thank you. <clears throat> Chair, we entertain a motion for an executive session to be held on July 15th, 2013 at 9 a.m. So made. We have a motion. I'll second the motion. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Okay. Uh, committee or legislative reports? Supervisor Johnson, do you have a report this morning? Uh, just a couple of quick ones. I had a webinar hosted by Granicus that went about over public participation using 21st century tools. And obviously, I've always felt that our board meetings should be more, made more interactive, which we're going to have a presentation on, especially so someone could attend the meeting <clears throat> who cannot drive the long distance and still participate. Uh, Larry Shore, the president of the International Association of Public Participation and Community Engagement, who's a consultant for the city of Austin, Texas, he spoke about their website, speakupaustin.org, uh, that engages public participation through online discussion forums, surveys, and interactive board agendas. They created it with the intent of finding a way to go beyond traditional in-person feedback methods. The City of Austin has engaged over 2,000 citizens online since implementing the website. And they have generated 800 plus ideas and received over 1,055 comments to improve governance. Over 50 community ideas have been put into action and 23 ideas have come to completion. Speak Up Austin is a place for citizens to post ideas and to comment on future proposals and or policies it is made so folks can easily access it via a mobile device, tablet, or desktop. Under future proposals and or policies, the city wants comment too. They list the history of the project or, and or the idea, along with the photos and the place for discussion. They also have surveys throughout the site asking for feedback on various city events and ideas. The city of Austin also has it set up so the public can comment on specific agenda items for upcoming meetings from the comfort of their home. Their comments are then added to the public record. Also, the National Association of Counties had a, a webinar on shale energy technology and the Tioga County and Pennsylvania's experience with welcoming the industry to their community. And while shale resources are not found in Arizona, they are found in our neighboring states of Utah, California, and New Mexico, uh, which would have a positive effect on us if these, these plans come to fruition. It is estimated the U.S. will overtake Russia to become the world's largest natural gas producer by 2015. 
and will pass Saudi Arabia as the world's largest oil producer by 2017. Tahoe County Commissioner Eric Coolidge gave us his take on what hyd hydraulic fracturing has done to his community. He said there's always been some drawbacks. <clears throat> for the most part, the new industry has created a positive for Tioga County. Some drawbacks he mentioned were the increase in traffic, an influx of out-of-state workers, and the pay scale the industry brought into the community didn't fit well with the local climate. Locals were leaving their retail jobs to go to higher paying jobs, making it harder for local businesses and even retail to find people to hire. Probably not a problem we would consider, a, consider in our county. Homelessness was also an issue that we're not prepared for. He recommended that any community preparing for fracking development needs to come up with an emergency response plan as well as prepare their emergency responders to deal with an explosion and on-site emergencies that they may not have experienced before. He said the industry was very good with interacting with the community and working through some of the early onset concerns like the increase in traffic. They were able to bridge parties together and address environmental concerns as well. The company provided educational forums and worked with local leaders in the community college to provide benefits and training to the citizens. With our neighboring states looking to explore the world of hydraulic frac fracking and with all the speculation about this new innovative technology in the counties, and it's a good thing for us to be prepared and support our sister counties. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Johnson. Any other uh, committee reports or legislative reports? There being none, we'll go down to the county administrator's reports. Mr. Andrews. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I, I intend to have uh, our uh, Nathan McDaniels, our information technology director give a, a brief presentation regarding uh, progress he's made in information technology and transparency. But before we uh, do that, uh, there's some rapidly advancing news regarding the fire up in the Wallapai Mountain. And so we've asked Byron Stewart, our emergency management coordinator, to come down and give us a, a, a brief update on, on uh, activities and status. Thank you, Mr. Hendricks. And good morning, Byron. Long time I haven't spoken to you. <laughs> Five minutes, I guess. Good morning, Chairman Watson. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, good morning, Chairman Watson, uh, Supervisors Moss, Bretherton, Angus, and Johnson. Uh, we've been discussing with the BLM this morning the, the progress of the fire, and shortly before I came into the meeting, um, we uh, hit a trigger point. Last night we established some trigger points with the BLM, uh, geographic trigger points that if it, the fire reached those points, we would initiate evacuations in Pine Lake or DW Ranch. And a few minutes ago, it, it did hit one of those trigger points for Pine Lake. So we'll be initiating evacuations for Pine Lake. Uh, I would emphasize that there's not an immediate urgent danger because the fire is, is backing in that direction and it's not moving with the wind. So it's moving very slowly. Uh, but we set those trigger points up to, to be as safe as possible so we weren't at the last minute trying to uh, get people out of there. So the Sheriff's Office, uh, in conjunction with, um, with uh, the uh, Pine Lake Fire District, will be initiating those uh, evacuations as we speak. Uh, last night we did uh, distribute pre-evacuation brochures to all of the residents in, in Pine Lake and along DW Ranch Road so they would be uh, aware of what they needed to do if evacuation took place, what they would need to take with them. So uh, that was undertaken by the uh, search and rescue volunteers under the sheriff's office. Uh, so they were prepared for that. Uh, we will uh, uh, continue to, of course, keep the monitor to the situation as what's going on. Uh, DW Ranch Road and uh, Wallapai Mountain Road were shut down yesterday afternoon, late yesterday afternoon, to all but residential traffic. And so now They'll probably be shut down entirely, uh, except for the evacuation traffic and emergency traffic going up the hill. Uh, we intend to, we'd already decided before this occurred to close down Wallapai uh, uh, Mountain Park today at noon, and that will be uh, available for use by the uh, uh, BLM uh, 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 crews that are going to be working on, on the scene. Uh, there will be a um, transition from local BLM incident command later today to a type 2 incident management team which is a, a self-contained team of uh, several hundred uh, qualified and, and uh, trained uh, wildland firefighters. Uh, they'll be able to provide their own logistics and uh, communications and essentially everything that's needed to support the effort up there on the fire. They will be based at um, the uh, Lee Williams High School. Uh, we 
talked to Kingman Unified last night and they've always been super about making their facilities available when we have something like this happen. So that, they'll be moving in there today. There'll be a briefing. Uh, we'll have a briefing and a meeting with the uh, incident commander. It's been moved up uh, to one o'clock this afternoon at the BLM office and so we'll be coordinating with them. Um, right now, the, most of the fire movement is, is away from Pine Lake uh, because we have a southwest wind. Looks like the winds are going to be about 15 miles an hour uh, today, so relatively light. And it'll, as long as it's moving in that direction, hopefully uh, they'll be able to, to make some containment uh, from anything moving in the opposite direction unless we have something drastic happen with the, uh, the weather. Uh, the, it, the, the fire itself, the most recent estimate overnight, it probably grew to nearly a thousand acres, uh, primarily toward the east, and it's um, within about a mile and a half of uh, Blake Ranch Road, but it's still a considerable distance away from uh, homes on, on that side, but we will be watching that situation. It's still up in the high country where it's, it's extremely difficult to get to and contain. Uh, once it moves out into the, the, the more flatter terrain, toward uh, Blake Ranch Road, it'll be easier to fight. Uh, there'll be less vegetation there, easier to get to. Uh, right now there are um, three uh, hotshot teams in town, uh, and uh, they're using one of them, I think, uh, or they, the plan was before we commenced these evacuations was to use one of those to be in a protective mode uh, out in the DW Ranch area. Uh, the other one was going to be deployed to Pine Lake to uh, protect the uh, Getz Peak uh, communication sites, but they're holding off on that now and reevaluating. Now that we're doing evacuations, it'll probably still be in the Pine Lake area, but they may not commit them to get speak right away. Uh, the third team is resting after putting out another fire with Kingman uh, Fire Department last night on uh, Coyote Pass. Uh, so that's pretty much the situation. There are three uh, heavy air tankers that have been requested to come in. Um, as you know, we're we're having to share resources with a much more critical situation down at uh, in Yavapai County. So uh, right now we don't have any immediate life safety concerns. So but hopefully we'll be able to get some more resources in to uh, to do some airdrops on the fire. Um, that's pretty much it for now. The uh, the only other thing I might add is uh, we have talked to uh, Public Works, and if we get a helicopter working with a dip bucket up there on a, out of a portable tank. Uh, to, to work the fire. Uh, we have about six of our county water tenders that are available to, to participate in that water relay to keep that tank filled. Does anybody have any questions for, for Byron? Byron, I would just like to say thank you for all the uh, information you were able to give us the last couple of days. An outstanding job and an outstanding job coordinating with everyone. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I'd like, uh, if the board Certainly. would uh, allow, I'd like to get Nathan McDaniel down here to show his progress that he's made in transparency with the IT department. Morning, Chairman. Morning, uh, members of the board, County Administrator Hendricks, and Council. Information technology has been working on some uh, transparency initiatives that the new uh, the new board and new leadership is kind of directed us to uh, to do. So I'd like to take a little time and unveil the what we're calling the meeting portal. Uh, it's basically a web-based portal where uh, members of the public, county, pretty much anybody that has internet access can access a list of Board of Supervisors meetings. The uh, currently, currently today we have the agendas, action agendas, minutes, video, and audio of the board meetings available uh, via the meeting portal. And um, I'm gonna, take us to the website right now. So on the projectors and on your screens, you should be able to see basically what the county website looks like. So in order to access the meeting portal, there is a link on the right hand side of the screen. Um, right next to the heading it says county videos. Um, the button says agendas, minutes and video. So if you click the button, it takes you to the meeting portal. The meeting portal, uh, like I mentioned, is a list of past and upcoming Board of Supervisors events. Um, the real big advancement on this product is, is really behind the video section. If you click uh, video, uh, I'm going to click on the July 17th meeting. So if you click on video, you basically are taken to a page that has the agenda in, in combination with the video of the meeting. 
and uh, kind of the real technological advance on this is we're able to timestamp the items that the board speaks about. And if I scroll down and look through the different items on the agenda, you'll notice that some of the items are, are blue, which uh, represents its clickable link. So if we're interested in uh, item 26, we click on item 26 and it tells the video player to advance the video to item 26. Um, our videos are hosted on YouTube. So after the meeting, uh, the, the, the digital file of the meeting is uploaded to YouTube. Um, depending on the size and length of the meeting, sometimes it takes us you know, three to four hours to get the video uploaded. Um, you'll see that that video loaded and started at item 26. And uh, it's sometimes faster when you're at home. But um, the, next, uh, the next phase of this development will be to have the actual backup, di backup documentation for the items available through the same interface. So when I look right now at item 26, 27, eventually there'll be uh, some type of link where you click on it and you actually get the actual paper document, well, the electronic form of the documentation that goes behind that item. And uh, you know, that's, uh, that's the meeting portal. One of the other things I wanted to speak about outside the meeting portal was um, a project called uh, openbooks.az.gov. I've mentioned this in the past. Uh, there was a new Arizona revised statute that came out that basically required all cities and municipalities to provide their financial information uh, through a publicly searchable website. So on the front page of the county website underneath popular services, we've put a link to open books, which is the state's web portal and our data is available there. So I wanted to drive this uh, real quick to kind of give people an idea of what they can do if they're interested in looking at uh, expenditure and revenue information of the county. Um, so visit the site and in the right hand corner of the page you'll see it says get started and there's a drop down box that says level of government. If we change that level of government to county, you'll notice that there is three counties available in the state of Arizona and uh, we're one of the three, which I think is a pretty fantastic achievement for us considering uh, we were the third county in the state to uh, get in compliance and use this uh, behind Maricopa and Pima County. So uh, I'm really proud of that. And uh, you know, I think this would be a great tool for people that are interested in looking for public information, which is kind of the, the real goal of the openness and transparency uh, stuff that we're doing. So if we take a look at Mojave, we can uh, choose the period, the type of uh, financial information expense, revenue, and employee reimbursement. Purchasing card data right now for Mojave County is not available in there as our purchasing card data comes from uh, our P card company. It's not actually in our system, so we can't transmit it. But uh, we can look at expense data, revenue data. And uh, that didn't yield any results. So let me, let me go back and uh, try again. I don't, I don't our, uh, it's, there we go. I thought I was gonna get stranded there for a second. <laughs> so if we take a look at the list of expenses for 2013, um, we up this, update this data quarterly as, uh, as our financial system is, is worked, the data is inside that system. So we run a standardized report that is, uh, uh, we work with the accountants and finance to, to meet the criteria uh, set forth in the statute. So if we click on any one of these uh, organizations, we can look at the expenditures based on organization. So it's uh, loading up a list of uh, expenses right now. And then you, you can click on each, uh, each uh, expense and view the transaction data behind each one. And if you want to download that transaction in uh, Excel or print it, you can do that as well. So it's a great tool for people who are interested in what we're doing with uh, taxpayer money to hold us accountable and make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. So any questions? Questions? I don't, I don't have a question, but I gave a little update on Granicus this morning, and uh, Granicus is the one that, that puts out the program that you referenced uh, earlier, and, and we looked at it in the past, but it cost tens of thousands of dollars, and uh, for people that aren't aware, our IT department did that in-house without uh, going out, so where other entities are paying, like I said, tens of thousands of dollars, the, the staffing that we have is has put together this program at no cost to uh, taxpayers. So I'm really proud of what you guys did there. Yeah, thank you. So if I touch on that just a little bit, um, you know, the, uh, the Granicus 
you know, Granicus is a, obviously they're a company that, that makes a lot of a wide range of products. So the meeting portal is basically um, Mojave County Development, our web developer created it, and it's pretty much our own self written, self developed version of what's called their meeting efficiency suite. So if you want to look at it from a cost perspective, that would be the product you'd, you'd look into and see how much that cost. And essentially, this development has saved us the upfront cost and the monthly and uh, annual ongoing maintenance of that product. So we're really, really proud about that. Um, the county's web developer, his name is Eric Advincula. Uh, he's really modest and he wasn't interested in coming and standing here. And uh, so I decided to take on that task for him. But we're really, really happy to have him on our staff. And, and this, uh, this meeting portal is fantastic and we can't wait to keep it growing. And, and uh, you know, uh, the website's obviously evolving all the time. So it's, uh, it's a living work in progress. And I'm really happy that we're able to make you, uh, make you happy. So thank you. Something. Nathan, you know, when I first came on and I spoke with Nathan and we talked about certain things that could be done and he was all excited, ready to go. And, and you and Eric have done amazing beyond what I even dreamed. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I had to go and I needed to go back and look at the video uh, of an agenda item. And it took me like a half hour just to find it and buffer it. And if anyone knows what I'm talking about, it buffers to catch up. And, and then the next day this was unveiled and I just went, it took me 20 seconds. And, and for those of us who use this a lot, it is, it's really a, a, a gift and, and I wanna thank you. And um, I also, I think last week you sent a, they had done a survey well, through Arizona about which counties actually have these kinds of things online. And I think we were the only, were we the only one or maybe one of two or three? Uh, so I was very proud of that. Yeah, I was uh, speaking with uh, Supervisor Johnson this morning, and, and that was one of the things that I mentioned was, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to see that we're ahead of the curve. You know, there, uh, there's only a handful of counties providing uh, streaming video and audio of the board meetings, as well as on-demand uh, access to the backup video, audio, documentation. So it's, uh, I think it's validation of the efforts from our department, and we're doing a great job, and, and I'm really happy about it and really proud. So. Uh, one other thing I, w I did want to mention was uh, we have upgraded the camera and video production system in this room. So if you access our on-demand videos, you will soon notice that they're in high definition quality. Uh, the last meeting was the first meeting we did in high definition and we're still fine tuning the system, but uh, you'll notice uh, exceptional clarity now when you go watch those meetings online as opposed to the old uh, standard definition ones. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Nathan. opportunities like this that make you really feel proud from Mojave County. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have the approval of the February 4th and March 19th uh, minutes. Chair would entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second for the approval of minutes February 4th and March 19th. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you, Supervisor Moss. All right, now we'll come down to the call of the public. Uh, those wishing to address the board, to call the public. Uh, we'll do so at this time. And I have Mr. Robert Kersey. If you'll keep your comments restricted to the items not on the agenda, with the exception of the consent, and uh, welcome, Mr. Jersey. Thank you, supervisors. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to speak. What I'm here about is uh, a few months ago, I was in Supervisor Angus' office after I paid my property taxes, trying to find out how I go about talking to my local fire department about their budget. Well, since then, my Mojave Valley Fire Department, which I'm not disputing, they're a great service. But I am disputing the opportunity to state my position and about the budget. Apparently, I called the few days ago and I talked to Deputy Chief Harley in regards to the posting of any kind of meeting notices. Well, he told me July 17th, uh, then he changed it to the 29th, and then the 30th. I mean, I'm not sure if he knows when the next meeting is. Um, my problem is 
we have no representation. They do not have a website. Their website has been down for over a year. That he said they cannot find somebody to maintain their website. I guess a question for our IT, IT person is, can they piggyback any of their information on the county's website? That would be fantastic. An opportunity to check it out. Pardon me, I'm very nervous up here. Please, please relax. Um, I asked him about how they post it. He says, well, they post the meeting notice at the post office. There's a small little post office on Highway 95 next to the library there. And at their fire stations. That's it. No web, no any other postings. Not in the paper, because he says it was too expensive. Well, then I tried to look back and find out when they um, post their budgets in the paper. Well, they posted it back in June the 11th, small little section. They don't even break it down. So how is anybody going to be able to view the, the budget, you know, make their comments? That's all I'm asking. You know, when I talk to them, it sounds like they're a bug hiding under a rock. You don't want that. You want transparency. My current supervisors have learned that, and they're fantastic. They're spreading it out. Maybe it's a possibility that our IT guy can inform him as to you know, a web person, or if they could piggyback their meeting notices or their budgets. You know, we've got nine different fire districts. The city of Bullhead City has a fantastic website. Go look at it. Thank you very much for my opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Gurdy. Now, <clears throat> we have one pro uh, proclamation this morning of Park and Recreation Month, July of 2013, uh, recognized as a pretty special event for Mojave County. And we'll move on to the consent agenda. Items five through 42. Supervisor Johnson, do you have anything? Item number eight, sir. Item eight. Supervisor Angus? None for me. Supervisor Brotherton? No, sir. Supervisor Moss? None. Okay. Chair would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items Five through 42 minus number eight. So move. We have a motion. Second. And a second. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion carried. All right, item number eight. Make a motion for discussion, Mr. Chairman. Motion for discussion. Second. Second. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Item number eight. Chairman, Supreme the Johnson. question I have for staff. Ms. Ballard, the question I have reading this, it looks like Mojave County is putting in for this rezone. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, that's correct, sir. Mojave County is the applicant. Does Mojave County own this land? Uh, Mojave County does not own this land. Uh, however, state statute does allow Mojave County to rezone property uh, at their initiative, regardless of who owns it, as long as we get expressed written permission from the property owner. In this case, uh, Mr. Sherrill did give written permission, and that should have been included in the board's packet. That was how many times has, has Mojave County done this? To your recollection, five, ten, less? Mr. Johnson, you are relying on a, or members of the board, you are relying on a faulty memory, but it seems to me it's somewhere in the range of about five. I guess the problem I have is we gave this 
this group, well, we, and there two people involved. You have Mr. Sherrell, and then we gave a quarter of a million dollars to this group, and now we're doing the, the rezoning. I'm sure it's under our name because are there fees involved in this or are fees being waived again? Uh, Mr. Johnson, members of the board, uh, when Mojave County uh, does a or acts as the applicant in a rezone, uh, there are no way, uh, fees involved. That's what I figured. That, that's all I had. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I guess the problem I have, whatever motion is going to be made, is we've been waiving the fees on this project where we waive nobody else's fees. And, well, the board hasn't waived the fee. The county administrator has been waiving the fees, um, which I don't believe is legal, but that's the problem I have. We have a, a private party. We don't waive anybody else's fees. Uh, if the board wants to take it up and waive the fees as a board, that's, that's the board's prerogative. But um, I believe if we have a fee, everybody pays it. That's all I had. Thank you, Supervisor Johnson. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Supervisor Moss. Um, this item concerns a community park which citizens are attempting to build. And per the board's past motions, I believe in February, or the past approval in February, the board has agreed to accept it once it's complete. Essentially, the community is building a, an asset, and they're going to give it to the county. To charge them a fee is akin to someone building a house or a building for the county and then the county charging them for the privilege of making a gift to the county. I don't see any problem with the county waiving fees. One, I think it's good policy, and two, it's common courtesy. Um, any other result would essentially be a slap in the face to the community who's attempting to create an asset for the community and the county um, to serve the public good. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may. I, I believe the, not to get into an argument with Mr. Moss, but the, the slap of the face comes to the citizens of Mojave County who, uh, this originally was supposed to be a improvement district that was formed by the district for those people to pay for their park at no cost to taxpayers. Now we're getting into where the county is not only given $250,000 to a nonprofit, uh, we are getting into the, into the uh, business of taking this property over in the future at a cost to the county and and I, I guess I'd have to ask the council, I'm sure he probably doesn't know he's not up to date on this, if if we did, I don't believe we formally took this park in. I do not believe, I mean, if, if, it's, if it's formally taken in, uh, then we would be in charge of it. We wouldn't have Mr. Sherrell still owning the land. I believe it's on a lease, right? Now, Supervisor Johnson, I believe that the uh, plan is for it to eventually be taken into the county once it's developed, once it's established. But that could be a yes or it could be a no, right? I mean, it depends on this board or the next board or some future board. There's no, been no formal vote to accept it. Maybe. Mr. Andrews? Uh, um, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Johnson, uh, I believe uh, there's a statute limits the amount of gifting uh, you can take for parks. And one of the uh, reasons that this property hasn't transferred over, I, I believe you're correct that the county hasn't taken official action to have this um, as a park with the exception of uh, that action that they took in providing the $250,000 match for the uh, facility and some of the language that went with that motion. but. Uh, uh, the plan for this park, at least uh, in my understanding, is to try to exhaust all the resources, all the private resources out there, uh, which are, uh, again, my understanding, it's in the millions of dollars for the creation of this park. And uh, the reason to uh, not have it in the county's hands is we're severely limited by Title 34 on how many gifts, a dollar amount of gifts per year that we can accept for the construction of a park. And so uh, uh, by keeping it in the private uh, individual's hands, they're able to collect and to uh, uh, have uh, gifted a tremendous amount of resources. And uh, the, with the belief that once those resources are exhausted, the county would take that park over. And I wanna mention one other thing that's uh, in the plans. The, expense for the county taking over the park is in the maintenance of those of the park facilities, the payment of the utilities and the operation and maintenance of that facility. 
and part of the plan is that the uh, school district in the area would uh, enter into an agreement prior to the county uh, taking over the responsibility of that park for the operation and maintenance of that facility. So not only are we getting a, a tremendous amount of uh, gifting by the uh, private individuals in the area and cooperation by the private individuals in the area, the future of the county's expenses, uh, if we can get an adequate agreement before us uh, signed by the school district, may be uh, you know, negligible. So I think it's a win-win for the area and that's why um, you know, I, I, I did go to uh, our county attorney's office and ask him what authority I had uh, in waiving fees and, and the answer was yes, I did have the authority to waive fees. However, we placed uh, the waiving of the fees on my county administrator's report and uh, for ratification by the board and at that time if the board chose that I didn't have that authority they could have removed that uh, item from my uh, my uh, uh, report and uh, determined not to fund it. So uh, I believe my actions were proper. Mr. Chairman I do have a question on that. Um, you've only been the county administrator for a short time but you have been in the county for, for quite a while. Do you recall um, how many times the county has uh, waived fees like this in, uh, in your time? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Johnson, I, I don't, um, but I don't think the county's ever had um, a proposal placed in front of us for a park to where uh, monetarily someone's uh, pledged a quarter of a million dollars for constructing improvements and that doesn't account uh, account for the gifting of the land and also the other improvements that aren't associated with that uh, individual's gift, which I understand is in the millions of dollars, plus the uh, the commitment by the school to maintain at no cost to the county the park once once we have it, once it's turned over to the county. So that's, uh, I have to view this as a very unique situation, you know, that, that I can't ever recall this occurring before. I guess I, I, we're beating this to death here, just a, an, an argument, but um, you're talking about agreements and, and, and gifting, and there's no official paperwork anywhere on this. This is all, they might do it, they could do it, it could be done. Uh, we talk about um, one that took place, we had a 15-acre piece of land on a well site at the Griffith Energy that was donated to the county so we could put our well system out there, which we have running up and running. That was gifted by Mr. Fred L. Dean, and I believe he gave us that land. He gave us a well, which was worth a lot of money. It cost Mr. L. Dean $15,000 to do the environmental impact study. We didn't even do that. So the idea that we're giving away free stuff here to something we don't even have, when here's somebody who gave us something and we charge them, that's the only thing I'm bringing up. I believe if we have fees in place, everybody pays the fees. That's, that's all. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Supervisor Ma. When it comes to the obligation to, or the, the lack of a writing reference by Supervisor Johnson, that is incorrect. The school district, the high school district, has committed in writing by two separate letters to take, undertake the maintenance of the park once it is completed, if it is turned over to the county. They are doing so because they want access to the sporting fields which are currently being built. When it comes to the written documentation concerning the county's right to take the park, the agreement between the landowner, Mr. Sherrill, and the nonprofit Fort Mojave, Mojave Valley Park Committee requires that entity to deliver the park to the county if the county wants it. And the county voted in February that it wanted it once the monies were exhausted. When it comes to the monies being put into it, the first two phases alone, this is not counting phases three and four, but the first two phases alone are $580,000 in cash and over a million dollars of materials and labor which are being donated. And that's just the first two phases. That does not count the value of the land that is being put into it. This is a tremendous community effort where the entirety of District 5, which does not have a public park, um, has come together to construct one. And when it comes down to it, the county is in the business of parks. There are numerous parks spread out about in Mojave County, Arizona. Uh, District 5 does not have one, despite District 5 being the second highest producer of property taxes in Mojave County. This is for the public good, it is for the greater good of the community, it's a tremendous effort for the community, and I think this should be so wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly supported um, by the county, as the county's board has done in the past, be it February vote. I think this is a huge positive, 
and we should express our appreciation. And to say we are going to charge you for the purposes of giving us property, um, I don't think is a good signal to send. Thank you, Supervisor Mott. I move to adopt BOS resolution number 2013-074, rezone of assessor's parcel number 224-20-021 from the, an AR, agricultural residential one acre minimum lot sign zone to an NP neighborhood park zone to allow establishment of a neighborhood public park and to establish minimum parking requirements in the South Mojave Valley vicinity south of Laguna Road between Aquarius Drive and Vanderslice Road, Mojave County, Arizona. I second the motion. Second. We have a motion and a second by Supervisor Brotherton. Any further questions, discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed? No. Thank you. Item is passed. Now we'll move on to the public, <coughs> public hearings portion of the meeting. Item number 43, uh, open the public hearing, discussion possible action regarding the adoption of uh, resolution 2013-077 uh, to rescind and cause property to revert from C2 general commercial and C2H general commercial highway frontage zones to the previous zone AR10. Agricultural residential 10 acre minimum lot size for failure to meet the conditions of approval as specified in Board of Supervisors Resolutions number 2007-194, 2008-165, and 2010-049, which approved the rezone and extensions of the time and rezone of assessor's parcel number 308-27-002 in the chloride mineral park vicinity west side of US 93 between Mineral Park Road and Chloride Road. Anyone here to speak to this item today? Item number 43. I have a question, Chairman. Supervisor Brotherton. Mr. Hunt, I think you and I had some discussion on some of these uh, reversions uh, <laughs> here a while back, and I'm wondering if you checked what the tax rate is on these parcels as they are right now, on this parcel as it is right now, and what it will be if it reverts back. And are they paying their taxes? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> Supervisor uh, Brotherton. No, we haven't uh, checked on the, uh, on the tax impact, actually. This, uh, uh, rescission is uh, due to the lack of the effort that was required on, on the part of the developers. But we haven't checked uh, on the tax impact. And you know the reason I'm asking this is because I think that sometimes they're paying a little higher rate uh, when it is like it is. And so I'm wondering why we uh, want it to go back to how it was and to a lesser rate of tax if they are paying their taxes, in fact. Why don't we just leave it alone and continue to collect that rate? It, sometimes it's not a different rate at all. But if it is, and if it's a little more, I think we should just leave it there and let them pay the higher rate. And uh, Supervisor Brotherton, I appreciate your question. We are not quite there where I can answer your question. What we're doing right now, if I may, <coughs> uh, we're working with the Planning Zoning Commission, and we had a, a working meeting, a work session, a discussion item on these to develop a, um, a general policy uh, for the county where we put in place a schedule of, uh, of development and a requirement and then before we require rescinding anything um, we made a proposal staff made a proposal to the commission they discussed it and it's coming back to the next the planning zoning commission for another discussion we want to give ample time for everybody to comment on it and then um, if the Planning Zoning Commission decides on that, we would like to pick up that conversation more and probably put in a component. I understand you would like to have a component on, uh, on the cost impact, uh, the tax cost impact. And then uh, hopefully we can 
bring that policy in forward to the board sí. uh, at a later time. As soon as the Planning Zoning Commission decides on it, we will bring it to the sure. board. Okay. It was, it's just a thought. I, I... I understand. Thank you. And many times when the people have to sell maybe this property because they weren't able to go ahead with their project, it, um, it's more saleable uh, when it's left at the zoning that it is right now. So that was just my question, and we'll check it out. And, and oh. we w I will try to make it a point to be at the planning and zoning when they address this. It, it is a, it is a, if I may say, it is a difficult uh, question. Uh, Arizona statutes, the board has the authority to put a schedule of development on, mm -hmm. on a rezone, and then if there is no progress, then uh, then can rescind it, like uh, this one is proposed. Uh, on the other hand, there are realtors uh, in the area. They say that oh, we should not, never ever uh, rescind anything. Once the zoning is there, it should uh, it should stick. Uh, the Planning Zoning Commission so far rejected that unanimously, but, uh, but there's a discussion going on, and the uh, cost component is definitely an important component that goes into that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hahn. The public hearing closed, Mr. Chairman? Close the public hearing. Motion for discussion and or action. Motion to approve item number 43. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve item number 43, which is to rescind uh, and revert to prior. Any further discussion? There being no further discussion, those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And those opposed? Aye. No. Uh, Supervisor Brotherton is a no. Supervisor Moss, I didn't hear yours. Uh, mine was an aye. Okay. My vote is for yes. The, the item has been approved for item number 43. Item number 44, open the public hearing, uh, discussion possible action regarding the adoption of board resolution number 2013-078 to rescind and cause property to revert from uh, E-SP, which is energy overlay solar photovoltaic overlay zone to the underlying zone of AR-36, agricultural residential. Uh, failure to meet the conditions and approvals as specified in Board of Resolution number 2011-015. Is there anyone here today to speak on item number 44? Anyone here to speak on item number 44? Close the public hearing on item number 44. Chair would entertain a motion for action. I move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second for the approval of the rescission. Those in favor, uh, any further discussion? There are no further discussion. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Item number 45, open the public hearing, discussion, possible action regarding the adoption of Mojave County Ordinance number 2013-06, amend the Mojave County Zoning Ordinance, section nine, definitions to eliminate the limitation on the duration of a retail rental or a lease. This item was uh, recommended by the commission and approved by a unanimous, unanimous vote. Anyone here to speak? Item number 45. Anyone wishing to speak to item number 45? Close the public hearing on item 45. Chair would entertain a motion for discussion or action. Move to approve. We have a motion. Second. And a second for <clears throat> approval. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. And motions carried. Item number 46, open the public hearing, uh, discussion, possible action regarding the adoption of Mojave County Ordinance 2013-07, amending the Mojave County Zoning Ordinance regarding the permit requirements in section 27-H-2-E-1 of the general provisions fences, hedges, and similar structures to provide for the issuance of zoning permits. 
the Commission recommended the approval by unanimous vote. Is there anyone here today to speak to item number 46? Anyone here to speak on item number 46? Close the public hearing and Chair would entertain a motion for action. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion. Second. And a second by Supervisor Johnson. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed? Aye. Item, item carried. Item number 47, open the public hearing, uh, discussion, possible action, adoption of Mojave County Ordinance number 2013-08, amend the Mojave County Zoning Ordinance to correct the title of section 27X from regulations for energy overlay, E-Zone, general provisions to regulations for renewable energy development. This is to more adequately uh, describe the contents of this section and amend section 27 to clarify that the 400 square foot limitation applies only to residential properties less than one acre. The commission recommended approval by unanimous vote. Is there anyone here to speak to item number 47? Anyone wishing to speak to item number 47? Close the public hearing on item 47. Move to approve. We have a motion. Second. And a second by Supervisor Johnson uh, to approve item number 47. Further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Item number 48, open the public hearing a discussion, possible action, adoption of Mojave County Ordinance number 2013-09, amend the Mojave County Zoning Ordinance, section 25, setbacks and area requirements to provide clarification and to increase the maximum de density of lot coverage. The commission pro <coughs> proposed and approved the amendment to the zoning that uh, provided a simple 50% of the lot coverage, and that was a unanimous vote. Is there anyone wishing to speak to item number 48? Anyone wishing to speak to item number 48? There being none, close the public hearing on item 48. Chair would entertain a motion. I move to approve. We have a motion. Second. And a second by Supervisor Johnson to approve item number 48. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Are those opposed? Aye. Motion carried. All right. Back on the regular agenda, sitting as the Board of Directors of the Mojave County Flood Control District. Item number 49. Discussion, possible action. Uh, approve the setting of the Flood Control District tax rate of uh, 50 cents per $100 of assessed evaluation uh, value for the fiscal year of 2014. Motion for discussion? So moved. We have a motion and I'll second for discussion. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. All right. Supervisor Johnson, do you have anything to like to add? No. Oh. All right. Chair would entertain a motion for action. I move to approve item 49, discussion um, uh, to approve the setting of the flood control district tax rate of 0. 0.500 per 100 of assessed value for fiscal year 2014. We have a motion. I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor? Signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Item number 50, sitting as the Board of Directors of the Mojave County Television District. Discussion, possible action, approve the setting of the Television District tax rate of 0 .0867 per $100 of assessed value for fiscal year 2014. Motion to discuss. We have a motion for discussion. Second. 
And a second. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Aye. Supervisor Angus. Okay. Um, I would like to ask uh, Yvonne Orr to come down and tell us sort of the history. Uh, we, I've been asked over the last year about this television district. I think people are a little confused about what it is that they pay for on their tax bill um, every year and who benefits from it and whether it is the job of government to provide TV signals. Thank you, Ms. Orr. Good morning, Chairman Watson, members of the board. The Television Improvement District was formed in accordance with ARS 1171 in June of 1988, excuse me, 1983. The initial intent was to acquire, construct, improve, extend, maintain, and operate television translator relay facilities to serve the communities and citizens located within the boundaries of Mojave County. Language from Resolution 1788A found the creation of the district would further promote the public interest, convenience, and necessity of the residents of Mojave County. Given the remoteness of many of the communities and Indian reservations in the county, the philosophy of past boards was to provide a means for residents to receive over-the-air television at an affordable rate. This was deemed especially important as many of our residents are on a fixed income and unable to afford cable or satellite services. I can comfortably say that many county residents depend upon this system for national and statewide news and information. In addition, this may be the only means to communicate emergency information in a reliable way to substantially underserved populations. The operation of this district is funded through a secondary tax, which is levied upon every parcel within the county. This has uh, been at a low of 0.0592 cents in 1993, and the high on this is 0 0.1536 in 1986. Our current rate of 0 0.0867 has been in place since 1996. Um, I can tell you that uh, the previous philosophies for the maintenance of this rate were twofold. One was the anticipated expense of the FCC mandated move to digital transmission. And two was the inevitable cap on sec secondary taxing rates similar to what we've experienced on the primary. Uh, in preparation for the mandated move to digital, staff along with our subcontractor, WECOM, uh, implemented a five-year replacement plan to buy digital compatible equipment, which would require only the change of a modulator to convert these signals to digital. In addition to that, uh, Mojave County um, challenged Sprint Nextel in a ruling at the FCC, which in essence was ruled in our favor. We, re we received from that $183,767 in equipment as well as in a reimbursement of $146,000 in reimbursable expenses for legal fees, labor fees, travel fees, and ancillary expenses. While there is no precise means to measure the overall use of the services provided, I was able to pull some information from the Nan National Translator Information Administration website. This, broke de this breakdown provided by zip code the number of converter bo converter box coupons. Uh, requested by Mojave County residents alone. And that number was substantial, 27,867 coupons. This covers those households that have analog televisions. Um, it doesn't cover all because others do have digital televisions that can pick up our signals. Um, have, have we ever done a survey other than, you know, this looking back on the boxes to see how many people have requested them? And is it, is it part of the statute, if there, is, if there is some statute that we go by that says that the tax rate must be um, formed based on how many people actually use the signal? As far as the statute goes, I would defer to the legal on that aspect, but I don't believe so from what I read. Um, we, we have talked with both our subcontractor and our DC attorney who have indicated there is no real means to measure um, just how many users we have within the county boundaries. 
Is um, Mr. Trahan here? He is our provider. Would you please come up? How, how much and how is it determined? How, how many uh, towers do we have um, currently? Uh, chairman and uh, board members, uh, my name is Jack Trahan. I'm with WeCom Incorporated. Um, as far as how many towers the county currently has, I believe there's uh, there's 12 or 13. I, I didn't bring a list of all of them with me, but I, I recollect about 13 sites that the county owns and operates uh, television from, which do cover primarily the populated areas and unincorporated areas of the county uh, with high def, def, now high definition television. Uh, it's uh, true 1080i is the format that the county broadcasts. So the uh, reception of that signal is much higher quality than you get on cable or satellite or anything else. So, so we give high definition? Is that yes, what you're saying? We yes, provide high definition. I don't even have high definition. <laughs> well, okay. that, that was mandated. The, the move, federal, federal move <laughs> the actual move to, uh, to digital was a big uh, right. on taking by the county to, to do this. And, um, right. But the people who use it, I mean, we've never done a study. I mean, it, it's there, so they could. I mean, I understand back many years ago, I used to work in cable television, and, and uh, the, the local cable companies were forced to put taxes on to provide cable to rural areas. But in this day and age, when people do have access to satellite, and dish, and all of that, I mean, I, I do understand there are people who use it. But again, is that, is that our job? And I would like, actually, I would like that to be put out to the voters. Is that something um, that voters feel is important enough to have on their tax bill? I've said that, you know, ever since I got involved, and, and I'll say it again. I don't think it's the government's job to provide people with TV signals. Um, I, I, I understand your position. Okay. Um, you can look around the country. There are states like the state of Utah that have uh, state-run in other words, their whole state is covered by uh, free television translators, and I was made aware of that years ago. Mojave County is kind of in the same situation. Um, the state of Arizona, I mean, uh, Utah, you can drive around the state of Utah with a, a motor home or go live wherever you want. And even in the little bitty communities, they get, oh, anywhere from, I want to say, 15 to 25 channels off the air for free. Here, you're just talking about Mojave County or all that, over Arizona? In Utah. Arizona? And, Utah, and, but Arizona, and, and Mojave I, County also now. Mojave County, but I believe, um, and I might be wrong, there might be people in this audience who can correct me, but I believe we are the only county in Arizona that provides this. That I, I'm, I'm not really aware of, but I believe you're right. Yeah, yeah I, I think I'm right on that. Um, and we had spoken and uh, we, <laughs> it would be very difficult to find out exactly who uses it, who really uses it out of need, and who, I personally know several people of means who use it because it's there. Um, again, that is, I think, so, I, I think that's something that the voters should decide. Now, uh, you were talking about tax levies and, and things of that nature. Um, as, as the technical side of this, I, you know, I'm not familiar with tax levies, I'm not familiar with all I do is get a tax right. bill, I pay it. Um, I don't, I'm sure that can be adjusted. Um, and I think now uh, that the Mojave County is in a pretty good state right now as far as the age and um, newness of all their equipment that's uh, on all the sites right now. So I can see that maintenance costs and some of that stuff, as far as buying uh, extra stuff, will be probably reduced in the next five years. So, um, you know, a guy, maybe, maybe the county could take a look at adjusting that okay. amount of money. I don't know. Right. Okay. Um, I would ask staff to possibly look into some things we can do, either putting out to vote or adjusting the rate or I, figuring out. We talked about possibly turning off, <laughs> really turning off the signal and seeing how many people call in. And it was suggested that those calls come to my office. <laughs> Please don't and do I'll that. Take that on. <laughs> Sorry, Kelly. Uh, yeah. Let me let me just uh, mention one thing. Um, that that is a possibility. It turn it just turn it off. Um, we could take an area like your area, for instance, and just 
<laughs> turn it off for a period of time. Um, I would recommend uh, that the county uh, choose wisely the, the period of time they do that in because like along the river area, you know, there's an influx of people in the winter time for the snowbirds come and stuff like that and people that live there and transit and back and forth. Um, so it would probably be something that could be done, say in December or January. Um, and just for a trial, however, to do that, certain things have to be done. Um, the, it would have to, I, I'm pretty sure, uh, we'd have to check with uh, the county's legal. I believe a public notice would have to be put out. Um, I also believe that the FCC would have to be informed um, and to actually tell them why we're doing it. And, you know, they would probably go along with it, but um, at least that would have to be done to protect the county. So those are just a couple of the things that I wanted to mention to you guys. Well, thank you. And, and, and I'm going to vote yes for this, you know, because this is going forward. But I do want us as a county to be thinking about the future of this. Thank okay, you. Okay, and I, I can make one more suggestion to all your supervisors. I know uh, Supervisor Johnson has gone with me before uh, to the site located down near Havasu. And I, I think he didn't realize what all was there. Um, and hopefully he got a little lesson and saw that there is quite a bit of equipment on that hill that belongs to the county. And if any of you other supervisors would like to go do that, I would suggest you do so. And I can personally take you to a site that covers your area or whatever and let you take a look at it. And it'd be, uh, it'd be eye-opening. Thank you. You bet. I've got a question for you, Mr. Tran. <clears throat> well, what do you estimate the total value of of this equipment, Mr. Tran? Uh, Yvonne, would, Yvonne would be a better, uh, have a better stab at that. I did, we did list out some stuff here a while back. I didn't bring it with me and I, I did, did she leave? No. <laughs> yeah. I, she had asked me to give her a list of stuff and I did have that, but I don't have it with me today and I don't, I don't be honest with you, I don't remember what the figure was exactly, but it's substantial. I believe that figure was 1.8. 1 1.8 1 .8 million? That's in sites and equipment on the sites. Keeping in mind that we do also have on some of our sites the Sheriff's Office, Game and Fish, police departments up in the Strip area. Uh, so we do have others on our communication sites as well. Okay, and my next question is, uh, does Mr. Trahan's company take care of those other people that are on our sites? Or do they have their own? I can uh, answer that. Contractor. Uh, they, some of them have their own contractor. We do take care of some of them, like the Mojave County Sheriff's Office, uh, the local law enforcement stuff. If it's a state-run agency, they have their own technicians that take care of their stuff that are on sites, such as Black Rock. Uh, the Highway Patrol takes care of their stuff. So uh, there's limited access to these facilities, if that's what you're getting at. Right. Um, some of them are government-only sites, like uh, Black Rock. Um, you can't have any private enterprise up there, so everything that's there is government-owned equipment. Okay. One additional thing I didn't mention, Gary, was the early flood warning systems. I believe we have a couple of those located on sites. That was my next question. Uh, we have an, a number of different activities occurring at these, these sites. If we were to not have the, uh, the district, where would we pick up uh, the expense? and operating these sites if it wasn't there. <laughs> I guess, I guess what, I'm sure the county has intergovernmental uh, agreements with the people that are on the sites right now. So if the television district or the county was to give up those sites, then somehow they would have to. Uh, that would come under like the sheriff's department would have to right, contract right, you right. or someone else then to. Right. Well, they're not my sites. They belong to the county, so... Um, right. But they would have to contract with you then to, to keep them up? Or whoever they want, whoever they wish. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Just one additional point. Um, the transfer of the county directory from the television district fund is quite substantial, in excess of $400,000 annually, and this money goes to support the assessing, the levying, um, 
collection of taxes as well, so this supports the general fund. Can you repeat that? The transfer to the county directory from mm -hmm. this fund. Now, John can provide probably more substantial details on that. Is in excess of $400,000 annually. So, so a lot the, of money from that district is used for other things. For the general fund. For the general fund. For the payment fund. of mm -hmm. treasurer assessor. I think we pay for legal fees as well. Okay. So. Right. And I just have one, one other comment to make. <clears throat> uh, would it be a possibility just to put a simple questionnaire in our tax, uh, tax invoices when we send our tax invoices? Would that be a method in which we could investigate the number of people using the service? That would be a method, but unfortunately it doesn't reach all of our consumers. Those who have a home loan through, it go, the notice would go to their bank. That's true, sense. that's true. I guess so I we can discuss methods to reach all of the customers and try and get some type of response. Okay, we're just a passing thought. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trahan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman. Any, any further questions? Yeah, the only ones I would have, it's not really a question, but we, <clears throat> anybody we collect for, whether it be um, fire districts, all of them, we collect, we charge them fees, so the, the, the television district isn't any different than anybody else. And uh, while we did it put away money in, in the past to go to the high definition, um, Ms. Orr and our D.C. attorney were able to get grants that paid for that, and, and that funding was then swept by the previous board to actually pay off the jail, so it <laughs> came in handy there at that time. So, Thank you, Supervisor Johnson. I have a comment. I'd Supervisor like yeah. Brotherton? Yeah. There was one day that a tower near Chloride was down. And I had three calls, all of them from elderly people, and one little lady was just extremely upset. Uh, she said, this is my only, only connection with the outside world. I'm disabled. I live in a single white mobile. Can you please call whoever and ask them if they can get this up right away? I have no connection with anyone. And I felt so bad about it. I did. I called Mr. Trahan, and he said, you know, we're aware of it. We're working on it right now, uh, but it may take a while. He called back in a very short time and said, say, can you call that little lady and tell her that it's up now and everything seems to be okay? I just really have a problem with cutting those kind of people off because I remember a time when I moved to Mojave County and I absolutely could not afford the fee that it was going to cost me to have TV. And I used this. I had three little children, and that was the only TV that they had. So I just have a problem with cutting them off completely from something like this because I haven't really heard a lot of complaints. I certainly have not complained about the amount that I pay uh, to share in that expense. So that's my comment. Thank you, Supervisor President. I see that you're standing at the podium. Uh, I am supposing you would like to speak. I'm Stephen Robinson, 3439 North Bowie Road in Golden Valley. I'm not going to speak to the issue of whether we should provide the service, because I think it provides a lot of service for those that do not have the funds. I want to address the fiscal issues. According to the statutes, you're supposed to take into account prior year's deficits and surpluses to determine the taxing rate for the district. This rate, as Ms. Orr has stated, has been the same 8.67 cents for about 17 years. In that time period, we have built up, at one point before last year, there was over $8.5 million in this fund, which they, you swept. And this was over taxation of the taxpayers. Right now, as we speak, there's about two and a half million dollars, which is between two and four years worth of funds to cover the future cost of the district. So at the very least, you should take a look at dropping the rate to what the, pro the real projected budget cost is for the upcoming year, which would probably be between three and four cents at the very most, assuming you want to keep this money in the fund, the two and a half million. Second issue I want to bring up. Two years ago, the county, right now with Mr. Trahan's service, there's two different contracts for the 14 towers. One contract is about 196,000 a year. 
The other, and it's coming up for renewal next month to do a new five-year contract. The other contract is a 10-year contract that was just done two years ago on the consent agenda. And my question is, how many times, and he could provide this information, does he specifically go out to service these towers? Is it once a day, once a week, once a month? How many different times are we paying? And how? It, the question I have is, who really owns the equipment? Because we've bought a lot of equipment through the county coffers, through this fund, and yet I see that they own the equipment, or do we own the equipment? We're buying it. We own the property sites, which, you know, the towers are valuable, extremely valuable assets to the county. I talked to Mr. Rick Murphy one time, and he said that vertical real estate is the most valuable real estate you'll ever have. So that's my concern. One, how much are we paying for Mr. Trahan's service? And two, why are we taxing so much that we can sweep $6 million out of the fund last year alone? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Robinson. Chairman, if I may, I mean, I, I just answered that question. The, the federal government mandated that we had to go to change over the signal, and that's why we had to have the tax rate there. And so instead of having one year where you doubled or tripled or did whatever else to collect the money, it was done over a, a year, quite a few years to build up that fund. And if we hadn't have gotten the grants, which they were finally able to get, then we would have had, that money would have gone for all the upgrades that went in. The, the grants, there was no substantial amount of grants. This is all tax money, and I'm glad you brought up the issue about mandating. Only the metropolitan areas were mandated to go to high definition. Mojave County was not in that mandate to go to high def. So we spent a lot of money several years ago, three, four years ago, to go to high def, and the law did not require Mojave County specifically to go to it. Maybe it's a great service to have high def, but it was not required by the federal mandate. And I'd have to disagree with you there, but the attorneys would be the best ones because they're the ones that told us that all of this had to be had to be done, and they came to the board and told us, and that's why it was done. And we have an attorney in D.C. who I've met with being back there, and, and he said the same thing. So. I, I read the review from the attorney, and I saw the press release f from the county, and both of them said it was only applicable to metropolitan areas like Phoenix. But I might be wrong. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Item number 50, approve the setting of the television district at .0867 per $100 assessed evaluation. Mr. Chairman? Supervisor Moss? Mr. Chairman? Yeah, um, just uh, um, a brief, very briefly, I think Supervisor Angus has the correct approach. We really should be measuring twice and only cutting once on this. So I do approve that. I, I do believe we should pass it this year, but we should maybe on the on direct staff to take a closer look at it this coming year so we can actually value the utility um, that we're getting um, for the dollars we're spending. Thank you, Supervisor Moss. Is that in the form of a motion? Uh, yeah, I'll move that we approve item 50 of the agenda, setting the television tax rate of 0 .0867 for $100 of assessed value for fiscal year 2014. We have a motion, and I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? There being no further discussion, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Item number 51, uh, discussion, possible action regarding the approval of setting the library district rate at point three two three six per $100 assessed value for the fiscal year of 2014. Motion for discussion. So moved. I'll second the motion. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those aye. opposed? This is for discussion. Any questions? There being no questions, I'll, in, I'll make a motion to approve the rate of 0.3236 per 100 uh, assessed evaluation for 2014. Second. And I have a second by Mr. Supervisor Moss. Uh, any further discussion? 
There being no further discussion, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I'm sorry. And those opposed, motion carried. All three items have been carried unanimously. Thank you. Item number 52. Discussion, possible action, approve the holiday lighting fiscal year 2014 budget and setting the district rate of 0 0.0193 per $100 assessed valuation. Motion for discussion? I move to discuss. We have a motion. A second. And a second for discussion. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. All right. Mr. Chairman, I, I didn't know what the holiday lighting um, district was. And uh, if, if someone can just briefly come up and, and explain it to everybody. I believe uh, Mr. Timko is oh. jumping off his stool to try to explain. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Angus, the holiday lighting district is a, uh, a customer formed uh, district or public form district to provide street lights in Holiday Hills. Uh, it was formed years and years ago, and the purpose of the levy is to pay the light bill on the street lights in the district. Um, from time to time, uh, we need to adjust this rate based on the actual electric bills that they're experiencing. For a time, we had built up a bit of a surplus uh, in their fund balance, um, and now electric bills going up have consumed that down to the point that we need to adjust this rate. I will point out that the, the district includes 4,457 parcels and that the tax, uh, the tax rate proposed will increase their annual revenues from approximately $3,800 a year to $5,400 a year. Do we take money out of this one too? No, we don't. Okay. Just not enough there. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay. I'm okay. In the form of a motion? Oh, okay. Um, I move to approve uh, the setting, uh, approve the holiday lighting fiscal year 2014 budget and setting a district tax rate of uh, 0.193 per $100 of assessed value. We have a motion. I'll second the motion. Any further discussion? There being no further discussion, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Uh, Supervisor Moss, was that a approval? It was an aye. Thank you. Item number 53, discussion, possible action, uh, adoption of the 2013-14 tentative budget as presented and set the public hearing for adoption of the final budget August 5, 2013. A uh, motion for discussion. So made. Second the motion. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Uh, Mr. Timko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Today you will be adopting the FY14 tentative budget for Mojave County. By state statute, the budget you adopt must be published in the newspaper of record to allow the public time to review your proposed budget and to make comments prior to the adoption of the final budget on August the 5th. The staff proposal for the tentative budget calls for total county expenditures of $253 million. Of this amount, $78.8 million is budgeted for the general fund. The revenues to support these expenditures will not require any increase in any of the property tax levy rates which you just approved in items 51, 52, and 53, as well as no increase in the general fund property tax rate of 1.8196. And due to the continuing decline in assessed valuation of the property in the county, these rates will actually result in an overall decrease of $573,600 to the property taxes paid by Mojave County taxpayers compared to FY13. The staff proposal does include a provision of a 2.5% pay adjustment for county employees, the first adjustment in five years. The general fund budget also includes a significant restructuring in the indigent defense program, which provides legal counsel 
for those who cannot afford an attorney. This is being done in an effort to control the cost for outside contract attorneys, which must be used when our in-house staff either has a conflict or is at their caseload limit. The recommendation also funds two additional sheriff deputies for patrol duties in the Arizona Strip area. The addition of these positions will provide better service and reduce the amount of overtime currently being encountered in patrolling this remote area of the county. Staff is also proposing to add 12 correctional officers for the county jail. This addition recognizes the high employee turnover of this job classification and the lag time between losing an officer and then recruiting, training, and placing their replacement. These lag times have often resulted in unsafe uh, staffing shortages in the past, and these additional 12 positions will correct that problem. In the non-general fund area of the budget, the staff proposal provides funding to outfit 55 of the sheriff's patrol cars with mobile data computer capability using cellular modems. This project will not only remove our reliance on an antiquated DPS radio system, which will soon be abandoned, but it will also allow our patrol officers to complete most of their reporting responsibilities while in their patrol cars, which can be parked in high visibility locations, such as school parking lots. Our capital projects this year will fund approximately $1.7 million in building maintenance and improvement projects, including $138,000 in upgrades to the animal shelter, $198,000 in improvements to the Bullhead City Complex, and $145,000 to recarpet the library in Lake Havasu City. Our major capital construction project planned in FY14 will be to continue the build out of the Division 7 court facility in Lake Havasu. In conclusion, the staff has proposed a budget that attempts to allocate scarce resources in a manner that addresses the statutory requirements of the county, along with needed life safety issues, in a manner which maximizes the delivery of services which our constituents rely on. In the time since the staff has published the tentative budget, there have been some subsequent events which will need to be dealt with in the adoption of the final budget. The state budget, which was adopted, included the restoration to the county's share of funding from the state lottery. This will provide $550,000 in additional revenue to the county, which is not currently included in the staff recommendation. Offsetting this positive change, we've also learned that the jail medical contract will in fact cost $91,000 more than we currently have budgeted for this activity. And finally, at your last meeting, you approved covering a $900,000 overage in the indigent defense contract attorney budget for FY13. The FY14 budget for this activity is currently at 964,000. Staff is recommending that the 558, 559,000 remaining from the lottery funds after subtracting the jail medical contract, that this difference be added to the indigent defense outside council budget. Although we have restructured the area to reduce these expenses, there's still a considerable amount of flow through, which will not clear the system until the middle of FY14 when these cases actually come to a conclusion. We also have expenses in this line item related to the capital murder case which will be appealed during FY14. In concluding, it's been my pleasure to work so closely with all of the department heads and elected officials in developing this budget proposal. I want to acknowledge the uh, extreme cooperation and help on us from the board uh, in reaching this and a, a personal note of thanks for item number 37 this morning. And of course, I would uh, be remiss in not uh, recognizing my outstanding staff for the outstanding job they do on a daily basis to bring this budget for your approval. I'd now be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Timko. Questions? Sure, I have a question. Uh, the health costs that went up $91,000, we just set the per diem rate for the jail. Does that mean we set the per diem rate wrong? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Johnson, we anticipated uh, some increase. Uh, we, we will probably have some other things that break in our favor, but uh, we set the rate based on what we anticipated that contract to be without knowing the final. Uh, we now know the final, and that 91000 would probably make a 
few cents difference in the daily per diem rate. I guess I kind of answered it. Supervisor Angus? Um, did we address the pay raise in this? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Rankies, yes, we, we had uh, several discussions with, uh, with the supervisors about their wishes regarding the, um, the practical application of this pay raise. And uh, it's our intention with, this, uh, with uh, your adoption of this tentative budget uh, that these rules would apply uh, regarding the 2.5% increase. First, the increase would not adjust the pay matrix. Uh, that would remain the same. Second. To be eligible, an employee must have been in their current position, range, and step for at least six months effective today to be eligible for the raise. Also, the employee must have received a rating of at least satisfactory performance on their last performance evaluation, which must have occurred within the preceding 12 months. And uh, fourth, those increases which would place an employee's uh, pay in excess of step 10 on the pay ranges would have any excess over step 10 paid to them as a lump sum with their rate of pay being capped at the maximum for step 10. Non-recurring. Non-recurring. Correct, non-recurring. So with, those were the assumptions that you would uh, approve along with the 2.5% raise. Supervisor Brotherton? Okay, I have a question. I, yeah, I've, I've done a lot of study and are trying to understand our steps and our ranges and a lot of things. Are we uh, mixing a COLA and a merit together here? Yes, ma'am, we are. Mm. <laughs> it's, not as it's, it's not purely one or the other, but it, uh, it does provide the, um, provide the pay increase to uh, virtually all employees who have been here for six months. And, and what kind of problem is that gonna create for this entire range and Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Brotherson, actually it's, it uh, solves a problem since we, okay. since there was a, a desire to not give a pay increase to somebody that has been here for a week and a half, um, we had to set a period of time and we chose six months. If we moved the pay ranges, then the starting, the lowest starting salary would have increased two and a half percent and somebody hired tomorrow would be making more money than somebody who had been here for five months. Very so we good. eliminate that problem by not moving the steps and ranges. Very good. That's what I wanted to know. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor, Supervisor Brotherton. Brotherton brings up a good point. I, I think we, we really screw up our system every time we do this because we don't raise the range. I mean, we have employees who have, you know, let's say, let's say well, they've been here six months, they get two and a half percent. and. And this year, we might give a bonus to somebody who's been here 20 years or at the top of their range. But next year, we don't give it to them. I mean, we, we have got to, if you're doing that, you don't have to raise the bottom, you just raise the top. We keep, you know, um, hampering our, our, long, our people with longevity. I, I just don't think that's right. I mean, we, the people who have been here a lot of years and put in their time and at the top of their steps should get the same increase everybody else. But that's not Mr. Timko, that's HR's problem. Thank you, Supervisor John. I'll see if I can make a, a stab at, at the tentative budget. Uh, I'll make a motion to the, approve the tentative budget. Supervisor Watt, or Mr. Chairman? Supervisor Moss? Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I do have a question for Mr. Timko, if I can have a moment. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Timko, um, is the budget, do I understand your initial um, comments about the budget to reflect that there were um, unexpected expenses, which resulted in the five hundred thousand dollars in lottery money, essentially having to be allocated to uh, matters which were not anticipated thirty days ago. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Moss, uh, we we did not anticipate because we did not have the uh, the final bid from the contractor, the actual amount of the jail medical contract. We now have that information. Uh, that's the ninety one thousand. Um, and, and that's something that we definitely need to cover. The, the remaining $459,000 uh, of the 550, it's only staff recommendation that that be applied to prevent which, that which was likely to be a repeated necessity next year at this time to cover the shortfall in indigent defense outside contracts. 
we're hopeful that our restructuring will uh, minimize that and that, uh, that this $450,000 uh, will, will cover what's currently in the pipeline from assigned cases and what's known to be a pretty expensive uh, appeal process for the capital murder case that we tried last year. Okay, so, so um, part of it was unexpected expense and part of it was um, likely expense which is being estimated. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, if we were to give a one-time 2.5% bonus on the same terms and conditions um, that you just outlined a few moments ago, uh, would that result in us spending less or the same or more money, the employees? Yes. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Moss, it would be the same amount of money in the current fiscal year. Right. Um, but we wouldn't be locked into each and every year having to do um, this 2.5% increase. If you gave a one-time lump sum bonus, it would not be locked in for the next fiscal year. No, sir. And is there anything preventing us from doing a one-time lump sum bonus as opposed to a permanent 2.5% pay increase? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Moss, that's completely at the discretion of the board. Thank you. And if I can say something else, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, Mr. Timko and Mr. Hendricks um, and their staff has done an amazing job on this budget. I'm just leery of agreeing to a 2.5% pay increase that goes on year after year after year. Um, going back to my comments on another item, I think we should really be measuring twice and cutting once. And we seem to be, on a financial standpoint, a bit in flux. Um, and, for example, what would happen if we hadn't got that half million dollars in lottery money, which we're not guaranteed one year from the next? Um, and there's a variety of other expenses, such as this jail, which keeps on popping up. And I think it's more prudent to go for a one-time pay increase as opposed to a permanent increase of 2.5%. And that doesn't mean that we take anything from the employees because they're spending the same amount of money. But it does give us flexibility in case the financial picture changes dramatically against us. So I really hope it changes dramatically in favor of us. Thank you, Supervisor Mott. And, and that's my comments. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Chairman. And I, I agree with Supervisor Moss, and I, and I think we'll go through the tentative now, depending on how the vote goes today, and we still can have that uh, discussion when we do the, the final final budget. So it's right. yeah, so it's not set in stone. Today. Anything we do today, the, just the amount is set there. We can't we can't go any higher. We can always go lower. Right. Okay. So just to reiterate, we can we can discuss this issue about one time, no, whatever. Still. Right. This, so, is, okay. this, is, this is just setting the, the upper limit, and we have we have the one million dollars extra. You always put Mr. Timko always hides in an extra million dollars. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> so then that, this will be the tentative, and then when we come back, it can go down, it can't go up, and we can adjust for pay raises or whatever. Whatever. Okay. We want. That's correct. I'll make an attempt to uh, to adopt the tentative. Uh, I'll move for the approval of the tentative budget as proposed by staff. Uh, set the public hearing for the adoption of the final budget on August 5th, uh, 2013, and <coughs> further direct staff to include the following changes in the final budget, which will be discussed at the August 5th meeting. Those include those items which we've discussed today. Number one, would increase the general fund revenues by $550,000 for the proceeds from the state lottery. Number two, increase the expenditure budget for the jail medical services contract by $91,148. And number three, increase the expenditure budget for indigent defense contract attorneys by $458,852. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Um, and if I could, Mr. Chairman? Supervisor Moss. Yes. I just wanted to say um, it's difficult sometimes appearing by telephone, but I wanted to say thank you to Supervisor Johnson for his clarification as to the, this, it's not really necessary to address the pay increase versus a one-time bonus at this point in time, and I do appreciate that information. Thank you, Supervisor Moss. Are there any further discussion? Questions? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Uh, 
unanimously to adopt the tentative budget. Item number fifty four. Discussion, possible action regarding the review and approval or disapprove the county administrator's recommendation to prohibit weapons <coughs> in Mojave County Libraries. Motion for discussion. Move to discuss. So moved. We have a motion and a second. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion carried. We have a number of people that would like to speak to this issue today. So we will start with them first. Jamie Starr from Bullhead City. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, um, Board of Supervisors, uh, my name is Jamie Starr. I uh, own property in Bullhead City, apartments, commercial property. I Could hope you give us your address, please? Um, I, I don't like to give my home address for various reasons. Uh, then if after I, the meeting is over, would you give your address to our to. clerk? Yes. Thank you. Um, I hold a concealed weapons permit in multiple states, and I carry a gun. In Arizona, we enjoy the right of self-protection. We have the right for pretty much anyone who isn't a felon to carry a gun nearly anywhere they want. This is as it should be. I take issue with several statements made, um, reported in Friday's Mojave Daily News regarding this proposed ban. Um, fights have been known to take place inside libraries over the use of computers, specifically when and implying that legally armed, responsible citizens are going to start shooting people over the use of a computer or who gets to check their books out first is the height of ignorance. I don't know who said this, um, but they have no skills to say that. Suggesting that responsible armed citizens make it more difficult for police during an active shooter situation is so ludicrous it makes me concerned that anyone so uninformed is in a position of authority in the county. Name one single incident where an armed citizen created a problem for police during an active shooter situation. It doesn't happen. What does happen, what has occasionally happened, is legally armed citizens have stopped <coughs> or reduced such events because they are already on scene and are actively at risk from the shooter. For the information of those who are not aware, there were two armed CCW permit holders at the Gabby Gifford shooting. Neither one pulled a gun or fired shots because of the crowded situation and movements which made it unsafe. Permit holders are trained for these kind of situations. Most permit holders have additional considerable training. I do not carry a gun lightly or just because I can or because I wanted to be a gunslinger. I carry because I face threats on a frequent basis due to the nature of my business. An untrained and ill-informed librarian should not have the right to put my safety and possibly my very life in danger by de denying me the right to self-protection while not providing repl reasonable replacement protection. The result of a firearm ban is I will be effectively denied the use of the public library that my taxes pay for. At the very least, I request the Board of Supervisors vote to allow holders of concealed weapons permits to carry their concealed firearms in libraries and county buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Can you read that? Is that, ben. Is that Ben? Mm -hmm. Okay. Ben Roddenbush. Please state your name and address for the record. Ben Rodenbeck, 17160 Mariposa in Dolan Springs. Uh, I am the deacon of Trinity Episcopal Church in Kingman. Um, in regards to the idea that the public should be allowed to carry weapons in the public library, I would like to quote an article in the Arizona Daily Sun um, on SB 1201, printed April 20, 2011, if I may. <clears throat> Proponents of the broader gun carry legislation contend that citizens have a right to defend themselves in public buildings or to be protected by armed guards. But not a single law enforcement official agreed that more guns would mean more safety. Their take 
is that the risk of gun violence caused by more guns inside of a building is far greater than if guns are banned. Further, <clears throat> if a shooting were to occur, untrained bystanders, Arizona doesn't have an official training, we just let anybody carry a gun, um, untrained bystanders firing their weapons would almost certainly cause more injuries. The article goes on, <clears throat> If there were any causal relationship between more guns leading to more safety in public buildings, that would be fine. But as gun advocates themselves really know, there is no relationship. While there is a clear statistical relationship between more guns and gun violence, whether the latter is causal is under debate. But statistics are not simply on the side of unregulated gun lobby. Well, with all of that said, the library is really a bit of a temple. It's a temple to free thought, free learning, and free speech through the written word. If I go to the library, and I do, I don't want to feel intimidated to read or not to read a specific book because somebody carrying a gun is looking at me strangely. I don't want the youth of Mojave County to miss out on expanding their own minds seeing new vistas or gaining new literary experiences because of an armed intimidator. The library is a safe place for parents to bring their children, I know, I have a five-year-old daughter. There are learning experiences, growth experiences on every shelf for both the children and the parents. I don't think I would feel very comfortable with an untrained stranger carrying a gun around my child. Freedom of speech carries with it the freedom to listen and to learn the freedom we enjoy at our public library is to learn, to discover, and to grow without anybody looking over our shoulders, without any kind of intimidation. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we have uh, Philip Shaw, please. My name is Father Philip Shaw. My address is 423 Spring Street in Kingman, and I am the priest in charge at Trinity Episcopal Church. I can't help but agree with everything that my deacon said, but it goes a little bit further than that. If you just look in the uh, headlines for the past month or so, I have not seen a single incident of an armed Arizonan protecting anybody else, defending anybody else in a shooting situation. I have seen headlines of a five-year-old who accidentally shot his father with a legally owned and legally stored gun in a friend's house. I have seen stories of one police officer and one security guard in the past month who have managed to drop their weapons and leave them behind in public restrooms. Libraries have public restrooms. By population, libraries have a greater population of children than almost any place else, probably other than schools. I don't want an untrained person leaving a weapon around for my grandson to find. I'm sure that the, nobody would voluntarily do that, but involuntary still creates tragedy. A lot of people would look at me and say, yeah, it's a typical Episcopal clergyman. I beg to differ. I have, in the past, had an Arizona concealed permit, which I, is no longer required of me. I have a loaded Glock 40 caliber handgun on my bedside table, and I know how to use it. But I don't have it with me today, and I don't take it when I go to the library. There were places where handguns are appropriate. There are certainly places where being defensive are appropriate. I would contend that the library, the school, the church, the county office building are not that place. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Georgia. Uh, Georgia. Carmen? Yes. 
My name is Georgia Carmen. I live at 3438 East Boreana Mine Road in Yucca. And I believe that we should not have no weapon signs at the library. The libraries should be as, as safe for us as this, as this building now is. There is no reason to have no weapon signs at the library. And uh, as the man before said, as he's never heard of anyone in Arizona defending themselves with a weapon. Well, I get a magazine from the NRA, and they talk about people defending themselves with weapons all the time, including people in our state. So it does happen. This, this gentleman just doesn't seem to be able to find out that information. I'm nervous, so you'll have to excuse me. Uh, we, there, the signs only deter honest citizens. They don't deter those who would cause trouble. Uh, when you create a no weapon zone, you create a kill zone. That's why we have the horrible massacres we've had in the public schools. That's why we have women molested on college campuses, because they are no weapons zones. They are not safe for the decent citizens. Most of the things, the people who do these things aren't stupid. They know that there's no one in these buildings who are going to be able to defend themselves. So that's where they do these terrible things they do. And they tell us we can leave our weapons in our vehicles. Well, that leaves your weapons vulnerable to theft. And if anything happens in a building, a weapon in a vehicle is not a whole lot of help. I carry a gun part of the time. Uh, I choose not to leave it in my truck because I have NRA stickers on my, tr in my, on my truck. That would certainly make it a good target, which means that I cannot use the libraries when I'm carrying a gun. That's not right. Uh, one of the excuses I've heard uh, from people who do not want guns in libraries is that children might see a gun. Well, children are going to see guns anyhow. That's not going to traumatize them. They see them in the movies. They see them on the streets. They see them in television. Uh, there are some parents who say they won't, a few parents who say they won't take their children to the libraries if people are carrying guns in them. Well, I feel sorry for those children, but we can't make policy for the few people whose judgment is questionable. Uh, and we can't make a restriction that people can only carry weapons if they have CCW permits because we no longer require CCW permits for con concealed carry in this state. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Doesn't appear that there's any questions. Thank you very much, ma'am. Barbara Pope. It's Barbara Pape. Pape, I'm it's sorry. It's okay, no problem. 3908 Jamboy Way, Bullhead City. Okay, after being informed of the, on the history of this recommendation prohibiting weapons on our li in our libraries and was asked by the, the librarian staff, I still oppose the recommendation due the, to this public, public communications and is informing the criminals and crazies that weapons are being recommended as a, as an, and pro, prohibited by, uh, in our libraries. I feel there's an importance of this communication that our community members are going to stand strong against the criminals and crazies and continue to carry our, our guns in public institutions. And I please ask you, board members to oppose this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all the people that were signed up to speak on item number 54. Is there anyone else wishing to speak to item number 54 that didn't sign up? Hello once again. My name is Robert Garrisey. 
My address is 7803 South Mockingbird Drive, Mojave Valley, 86440. Mr. Moss, you are my new supervisor, and I appreciate Karen's help with locating what I was talking about earlier. But I'm here right now. Whatever happened to common sense? I think all of us were raised with common sense. I raise my hand for common sense. I'm for the Second Amendment for carrying guns. I have no problem with that. I think there are places where they are not, whatever you want to call it, should be, whatever. A church, a, a school, a library. They're sanctuaries. Even here in, in the Mojave County Supervisors. You know, when I go to my um, cable company, Frontier, to pay my bill, they have a sign, no weapons allowed, for good reason. I mean, I don't oppose anybody carrying a weapon. That's their choice. My choice is to go to a place where I think common sense dictates I don't have to look around and see if somebody's carrying a gun. I mean, everybody has their rights. And, and I was raised with common sense, and I think that's just something. You know, the previous super, you know, religious people that were up here, you know, the one reverend or father had a gun permit. He carries a gun. I'm sure he doesn't carry it to church, and he wouldn't carry it to a library wouldn't carry it to a school. I think it's common sense. We were all raised with common sense. What's, what's happened to it? Thank you. Can I, can I ask a question, this gentleman? Sure. You said you go to pay your cable bill, and there's a sign that says no weapons allowed. At Frontier, yes. Frontier. Is there a metal detector? No. Just the sticker. Is there just, a guard? Just the sticker. I know, but is there a guard who checks no. it? No. And so you're sure when you go in there that no one's carrying weapons? No, I'm not. Common I don't sense. look for it. I don't Common look for sense. it. Yes. Common yeah. sense dictates that people who are going to do harm will go in there no matter what a sign says. So unless you're going to go all the way, it is a false sense of security. Yes, but I choose to believe everybody is raised with common sense. Even people who mean to do harm, you I, believe they, I, they I have common I can't prohibit. Sense. I can't prohibit people who are gonna do bad, right. okay? You talk about putting somebody in a school with a gun to protect the kids. Well, look at, the guy went in with an AK-47 and shot the door out. You think somebody with a gun is gonna be able to stop him? Yes. <laughs> but, I don't think so. Another, you know, That's another argument for another time. I just, the Bank I just of America to... that was robbed in California, what? Two, three years ago, the guys had body armor, AK-47s, cop cars from all over came. They couldn't do a thing. It finally took SWAT. You know, people are going to do I, what they're going to do. We can't stop everything. But what we're True. talking about, well, uh, and thank you very much for coming forward. We can hope and we can have faith. Okay. That's the best we can do. Thank you very and much. And common sense, I hope. Okay. You know, we talked about this at our last meeting, and uh, we talked about the process that people go through when they go to the library. And it seems to me like the same thing that we had when we had here is a false sense of security. Um, people who are going to do harm do, are, 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 are going to do their harm. There will be no one in that library to protect. And that's what was, what's, that was one of our biggest problems uh, with the whole arm, arm ban in general. Uh, as Supervisor Johnson said the last time, do we allow backpacks? Does anyone frisk the backpacks? No, but history, recent history has shown us that, that that is where people are bringing in things. So our hope is common, I, I will echo you, do you common want to sense. Do you want to arm the librarian? Excuse me, sir. <clears throat> excuse me, sir. I, I believe uh, Supervisor Angus has the floor. Right. So, you know, I understand this is an emotional subject. I do believe that common sense has been taken out of it, and it's just become a very emotional uh, subject. The Friends of the Library, the Library Advisory Board, I, I know that they have been vocal in their um, support of banning the weapons. We have discussed 
the only way, and I'm not even sure I am for this, but since there is a guard at the door, this guard at the door at the Bullhead Library can't even stop people from, from stealing bicycles. We've had a rash of bicycle thefts right in front of the guard. You know, this is an unarmed guard. Maybe we should look at the possibility of putting armed guards. Is that one, that would be sort of the only way that I can even foresee um, stopping this uh, or supporting this uh, ban. So um, I, I thought we'd have more people giving more suggestions here today. Um, and that's all I have to say about that. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Moss. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, uh, the response to some of the speakers who are in favor of banning weapons in the library, um, I have two comments. Um, one is philosophical, one is data. Um, in 2013, this year, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, um, commissioned a study, and that's not the most conservative organization. And using the services of the Institute of Medicine and National Resource Council, they discovered that there's between a half million and three million per year defensive handgun uses in the United States. And it's my contention that if we're going to take away a person's right to self-defense, we might must provide an adequate alternative. I mean, if we're going to have armed guards in our security, in our library, complete with the ability to check these backpacks via magnetometers, then yes, I would be fine um, with, not fine, but I would reluctantly accept the idea um, that we should disarm our citizens um, because there's other societal issues out there that must be considered. You have to weigh the two. But so far as I'm aware, this budget does not um, account for magnetometers in our library branches. It does not account for armed guards in our libraries. And basically what this proposal means is we're going to post a no weapons sign in front of our libraries and we're going to hope and pray that nothing bad happens. And my view is the reason that the people who are unstable go to schools um, and murder people, murder small children, um, is because they know they're stuck in a barrel. There's nothing that's going to stop them. Uh, an, armed, an unarmed security guard, um, as Supervisor Angus mentioned, who can't stop a bicycle being stolen, is not in the position to stop the guy with the AR-15. While on the other hand, a law-abiding citizen may be, may be, I stress the word maybe, it's not guaranteed, but some chance is better than no chance, might be in a position to stop that person. And in my view, and this is what it comes down to brass tacks, if we're taking away a right to self-defense as a government, and that's what we are, sitting here as a board today, part of the library district, we must provide an adequate alternative to ensure that our citizens and our children are protected. The county administration building that, that, uh, that the board sits in has armed security guards. The courthouse has armed security guards. I don't think that our children are due any less if we're going to take away their rights to self-defense. So in my opinion, um, and this is just my opinion, we should deny this motion um, that we should direct the signs come down. And if and when the county administration finds the funds to put up magnetometers and provide for armed security, then we can consider boosting the libraries. Thank you, Supervisor Moss. And that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Moss. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I guess if everybody's done, uh, this was brought up in January when we first took office. We're now in July. We beat this horse to death, so I would make a motion to deny uh, this item. We have a motion. Second. <clears throat> we have a motion and a second by Supervisor Moss to deny uh, this item. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed? Motion carried. Item number 55, uh, discussion, possible action, uh, request by Mojave County Fair Association to increase their budgeted annual county funding from $25,000 to $35,000. Uh, motion for discussion? Second. Uh, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Uh, the Fairgrounds Association initiated a letter that was sent to, to me and, uh, and all of us indicating that they wanted an increase of $10,000 over the $25,000 which 
we had budgeted for them. I would like to share with you that I've asked for a business plan, I've asked for a capital improvement plan, and I've asked for a plan on which they intend to use the $25,000 for. As of this date, we have not received any of those three items. So it's my opinion that until we receive those three, that uh, I have no interest in, in adding those dollars to their maintenance contract. They also, at, the, at this time, have a fairly sizable amount of dollars uh, built up in their capital reserve fund. So. Sounds cool, Mr. Chairman. I would second a motion. I'd even give them the twenty-five thousand if you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I have a comment. Supervisor, President. I have been with Chairman Watson when he has explained over and over and over what we needed in order to help them uh, and promote this fairgrounds because it could be. I mean, it, it's just an opportunity over there that I feel like it's just kind of slipping by. Uh, certainly could be a lot more than what it's doing right now. And they just have absolutely refused. They act like they don't know what he's talking about. I don't know. So I, I agree. I can confirm what he's saying. There's, I don't see any reason to give him any more money. Thank you, Supervisor. I was that in the form of a motion? Um, Mr. Chairman? I'll make I may? Supervisor Moss? Um, I mean, I'm not certain um, how much this money impacts their budget, the 25 versus 35 versus zero. Um, but the three documents you have requested seems to me to be very reasonable and not an undue burden for an entity which would, I would hope, um, has a clear goal and a clear business plan in mind. Um, perhaps you know, reducing it to zero and, re and having their $25,000 or $35,000 funding conditioned upon them delivering those three documents might create an impulse for them to get it done. Thank you, Supervisor Moss. Uh, I appreciate your support on that. So we just take no action then and then we'll just die? Uh, no action be fine. Okay, item number 55 has uh, refrained from action on no action. Item number 56, discussion, possible action, adoption of the Board of Resolution 2013-85, encouraging the federal government to control the excessive population of feral boroughs and to formulate and implement a management plan that will address the dangers they pose to travelers on Mojave County roadways as well as the destruction of the habitat they are currently causing in Mojave County. I'll make a motion to uh, pass resolution number 2013-85. Second. second. Motion and a second. Uh, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those aye. opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Item number 57, a discussion, possible action, implementation of the NACO prescription drug discount card program for Mojave County employees. Motion for discussion. Second. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those aye. opposed? Okay. Supervisor Brotherton. Okay. I have a lot of material here. And Christy, uh, one of Carol Meyer's employees, has done a lot of work on this and gotten a lot of information. Now, this is not a, an insurance program. This is a prescription discount card. You can have this no, no matter what, no matter how much insurance you have. I did find out from CVS and some of the other pharmacies, you can't use your uh, insurance discount and this discount together. But I also have found out that many times the NACO discount is more than what the insurance discount is. And I know this for a fact because I've personally checked this out. Uh, so there's no cost to the county. 
we can, and anybody, it's not just for employees. It says employees on here, but it's for anyone in Mojave County. And, and it's just a matter of filling out the information, getting your card, and then under certain conditions, if we don't um, have them do all the flyers and the advertising and everything for us, for every prescription that's filled, Mojave County will receive a dollar. And uh, if, they, if we have them do everything, we won't receive that dollar. But it's uh, just a great program, I think, for an opportunity for the people of Mojave County, not just employees, but anyone, uh, to have discount uh, prescription drug available. And it's very, very uh, popular. In fact, I think Mojave County is the only county that is not doing this in Arizona. So. Anyway, we've got all the information. Christy, would you like to say anything? Would you like to add anything to this? <laughs> okay, because she has kind of volunteered to take care of this and be the, the, the go-to person uh, to get this started and get this implemented. So if we just kind of have a, a consensus that, yeah, let's go ahead with it, why we will we will do this. Well, instead of consensus, why don't we just take a vote? Can, okay. I, can I ask a question, though? Sure. I just, you know, I know uh, down in Bullhead, MEC has a similar program, and it's a great program. I just want to make sure that people understand, employees understand that if you use the card and it doesn't count towards your insurance, it also doesn't it count towards your deductible, correct? Mr. Prince? So, because when you if, you, if you have the high deductible plan here, all your uh, prescriptions go to your deductible, but if you use that, it won't count towards your deductible. You have to use your plan. So I just want to make sure if we can maybe just iron that out beforehand. I don't want people to be misled yeah, and then say, wait, I paid all this money, but I did, it didn't go towards my deductible. So I just want to make sure we, everybody understands that. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> did we have we brought this up to the to the county before, and there's been no there's been always been pushback from staff. Has staff reviewed this? Is there any pushback this time? Is there any problems with this? Anybody sees the staff this time? No? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Johnson, if I could, and it pleases the board, could I have Rhea Suna come down here and discuss this? Okay. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, supervisors. Uh, as Supervisor Johnson said, this came up about three years ago, and we reviewed it then. Uh, the last week or so, uh, we reviewed it again in concert with uh, our benefits consultant, uh, Aaron Collins and Associates. It's pretty much the way uh, Supervisor Brotherton uh, describes in terms of the option for employees, and certainly Mojave County residents can use it. Uh, it is of some, uh, well, I guess the first question is who's going to administer that? Comment was made about Christy, or is it the benefit staff? It's probably some administrative uh, work. Don't know to the extent we haven't researched that, but uh, Supervisor Angus is correct. And this really pertains just to employees. Uh, through the EBT trust fund contracts we have with uh, Partners RX, that's an insurance program. If employees opt to use the NACO discount card, and it may be to their benefit financially, Ms. Angus is correct, they cannot use that dollar to their, their deductibles. And that's the only stipulation that the employees should understand. But yes, Mike, uh, we did review it last week. Any further questions for Mr. Suna? I don't think there's any administrative cost, to tell you the truth. It's processing some paper. We really didn't look at it because it's minor. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think it's basically they just pick up the forms and fill it out and they mail it in. We don't really have any cost, so we're going to have to be making it available. That's all we really have to do. That is correct. And, and it's more for probably the public than it is for our own employees. That's correct. I also understand that the prisoners over at the jail can get a card and then their prescription drugs can be discounted also. So mm -hmm. that's uh, 
That's long, another maybe plus. As long as we get the dollar, that's it. Yeah, as long as we get the dollar. <laughs> chair, <coughs> chair would entertain a motion for approval. I move to approve item 57. I second the motion. We have a motion and a second uh, for the approval of item number 57. For discussion, Mr. Chairman, can we have an uh, addition to that to have staff uh, bring us back something within 60 days in case there is a problem that shows up? Certainly. Any questions? Thank you. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Item number 58, uh, Supervisor Moss, I have two uh, people. I have two people that wanted to speak to that item. What was? What's your discretion? Um, I have no problem with uh, people speaking to any item which has been properly agendized for the um, Mr. Chairman's information, the rest of the board, and the speakers. Um, based on some of the past comments made in other agenda items, um, I would like to withdraw mm. item 58 um, at this time for two reasons. Um, one, based upon the statements made today, there's no funding for it that's um, available. And two, there seems to be a misconception that this was going to be a straight grant as opposed to a contract for services, and obviously things need to be worked out. So it would be my desire to withdraw item 58, and whether the speakers speak, I have no opinion on it one way or the other. Yeah, okay. I Thank you, comment. Supervisor Ma. Uh, Supervisor Brotherton. I just have this comment. I just do not believe that it is my place as a supervisor to take the public's money and give it to any nonprofit organization or any charity. The people have the choice to do that. I'm not sure about legal legality, but I just don't feel it's appropriate for me to be using someone else's money to give somewhere that might not be their choice at all. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Supervisor. Brother Tun, okay, Supervisor so Angus. If we're going to make statements, <laughs> okay. And I had a whole thing which I want to know a lot of people, and I'm, I know you're disappointed. Did, did you guess, take the so. fifth of the fifth amendment? <laughs> did I take? <laughs> no, but I guess it doesn't matter anymore if you do or not. Um, I just I wanted just to make this statement, and it's, it's part of a longer thing having to do with Davy Crockett, but I'll spare you guys. I know you ever wanted to. Every American, citizen, every American citizen has a moral and spiritual obligation to see that no neighbor, no person, child, or adult suffers for lack of necessities while he has the slightest surplus in his own name. But neither does man have the right to use government and the law in the name of charity to force the unwilling to do that which he would not do if the choice were his. And before any citizen concludes that the poor have a better life under state welfare than their counterparts had under true charity 100 years ago, he should examine the present and investigate the past. So it is my view that giving county money, public money, to nonprofits is not only a bad principle, bad precedent, but I believe it's unconstitutional. Thank you. Supervisor Inga. Um, if I could say something, uh, Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Moss. Mr. Chairman, um, under the contemplated motion and the item, because I've heard the word give a couple times, there was no intent to give. There was an intent to enter into a contract for services. My specific idea would have been for the victim rights issues um, in association with law enforcement and able to educate them, provide the information that they require in order to protect their interests when they become a victim of crime. That was is written broadly in the agenda item because my idea is not the only idea that this board may have brought up. Um, regardless, there was no intent to give. There was an intent for my part to enter into a contract for services. Having said that, um, I, it's my intent and my desire at this point to withdraw item 58. Thank you, Supervisor Moss. Meeting adjourned.